Hello. 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 I'm Jim Lindsay, the director of the Robert S. Strauss Center for International Security and Law here at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to our uh, event tonight, a conversation on security challenges in the Middle East. I hope you have a very good event planned for you. I would respectfully request the start so we can have a very good discussion. But if you have a BlackBerry or a cell phone or any other device prone to play Tchaikovsky or the Jonas Brothers or any other music of choice, if you could please mute it uh, or turn it off. Uh, we are delighted and honored tonight to have as our guest someone eminently, indeed uniquely qualified, to talk about security challenges in the Middle East, General John Abizade. Uh, General Abizade has a remarkably distinguished and illustrative career. And I'd like to, if I can indulge on the general, take a few moments to go through it, because I think it's worth uh, describing. Uh, he retired last year after a 34-year career in the United States Army that saw him rise from an infantry platoon leader uh, to the youngest four-star general in the United States Army. Uh, during his career, he held a wide range of posts and assignments in 1983. He participated in the invasion of Grenada, where he led a Ranger rifle company. Uh, his exploits uh, there were fictionalized in the 1986 uh, Clint Eastwood film, Heartbreak Ridge. Uh, two years later, he served as an operations officer for the UN Observer Group in Lebanon, the uh, homeland of his paternal grandparents. Uh, after the 1991 Gulf War, he led US forces charged with providing haven for Kurds in northern Iraq. Uh, that were being persecuted by Saddam Hussein's forces. In the mid-1990s, he served as an assistant division commander in Bosnia. He then returned to his alma mater, West Point, where he was the 66th Commandant of the Military Academy. Uh, so he's very familiar with academics. And football. And football. <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, he subsequently held a number of senior posts in the uh, Department of Defense. In July 2003, he was named commander of US Central Command. Uh, CENTCOM oversees military operations at the time. You were there, 27 member countries. Uh, displayed up here on our map behind us, the Middle East, the Horn of Africa, and, and parts of South and Central Asia. And as commander of uh, CENTCOM, General Abizade was responsible for overseeing uh, the US wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, General Abizade was uniquely qualified for his position as commanding general of CENTCOM. Uh, in the 1970s, he was an Olmsted scholar at the University of Jordan in Amman, Jordan, uh, where he studied Arabic and became fluent, uh, and also trained with Jordanian Special Forces. Uh, he then went to Harvard, where he earned a master's degree uh, in Middle Eastern Studies. Uh, I think this is a story worth telling. The director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the time was a professor named Nadav Safran. Uh, who was a titan in the field, and a man who I can tell you from personal experience had very, very high uh, standards. And when it was announced that General Abizade was going to be the head of CENTCOM, he gave an interview with the Boston Globe in which he said in his 30 years of teaching, he only kept one, one uh, master's thesis during that time, and it was General Abizade's 100-page uh, thesis on Saudi Arabian defense policy. So he has high praise uh, on the uh, academic front. And I believe, uh, as uh, Professor Saffron put it, it was absolutely the best seminar paper I ever got in my 30 plus years at Harvard. Uh, General Abizade has earned numerous military awards. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll just mention a couple. Uh, the Defense Distinguished Service Medal with Oak Leaf Cluster, the Legion of Merit with Five Oak Clusters, and a Bronze Star. So I'd ask all of you to join me in uh, honoring General Abizade for his service to the country and welcoming him to the University of Texas. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. General, uh, looking at this map up here, it's a very, very large expanse of terrain. It's even bigger than Texas. And uh, the President, uh, Obama, is going to come in and be responsible for making numerous policy decisions in the region. And perhaps the best place to start, if you could, is sort of take us on a sort of tour the strategic horizon. What do you see, based on your experiences, be the major challenges facing the incoming administration? Well, before we do that, can I Put just tell one quick story about this area? Certainly. That I think the uh, folks here might like. 
Um, when I took command in 2003, there were 23 countries, or 25 countries. Syria and Lebanon were not part of it. And the Secretary of Defense at the time, of course, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, called me up and he said, General Abizade, I'm looking at the map of your area of operations, and I noticed that Syria and Lebanon are not in the area. And I'm thinking of adding them to your area. What do you think? So for those of you who think that we didn't have communications with the Secretary, I automatically proved you wrong. Um, and I said, well, Mr. Secretary, we've got a war in Iraq, a war in Afghanistan, piracy off the coast of Somalia, uh, terrorism in every one of these countries, uh, all sorts of other threats to peace, and plus we've got to keep the flow of oil moving. All things being equal, I don't want them. <laughs> and he said, thank you very much, you have them. And I said, well, while you're at it, could you give me Haiti and North Korea? <laughs> But, but the point of the matter is that this is a tough part of the world. And to get to Jim's questions, uh, you know, it's, it's clear that the next president will have to deal with this part of the world. It would be nice if we could either st stay there or go home. Uh, but that's not the issue. The issue is how do we stay there? How do we shape the outcome? And I believe that there's really four really broad strategic problems that we can talk about as you want or, or in a question and answers with the uh, audience. First and foremost is the rise of Sunni Islamic extremism as exemplified by groups such as Al-Qaeda and people such as Bin Laden and Zawahiri. And this is not a group of crazy terrorists that hang out in the Afghan-Pakistan border area. It is a movement that has a view of the world and what they want to do with it and uh, where they think our place is in all of this. And while we may be a factor in globalization, they want to be a factor in globalization as well. They want the world to globalize along their terms. And so uh, it's very important to recognize that this movement is religiously based. It doesn't represent mainstream Islam, uh, but it's very dangerous and it's managed to show itself not only in this region, but here at home in the United States. Uh, in Indonesia, in Britain, you can name country after country. A and it, it is a problem that all of us are going to have to deal with for a long time to come. And it is an ideological movement. It is an idea that we must contend with and we must compete with in the years ahead. So that's strategic issue number one. Strategic issue number two is the rise of Shia Islamic extremism as exemplified by the nation state of Iran. What do they want to do in the region? What are their goals? What are their objectives? Do they want to dominate the region? Do they want to have an excess stay in the region? Do they want to uh, move against the Israelis? How aggressive will they be? How dominant are they trying to become? But their government represents Shia Islamic extremism. It's a mullah religious-based government and again, uh, has no use for the United States in the region. Third issue is the continuing corrosive effect of the Arab-Israeli problem. It drives people to the extremes because they have no hope for the better future. It's absolutely essential in my mind that the new administration attack the problem of the Arab-Israeli conflict from the beginning of the administration, as opposed to doing what normally happens, which is attack it at the end of the administration and then run out of time, uh, which is happening now to President Bush and happened before to President Clinton. And the fourth issue, which is near and dear to my heart, is our over-reliance on Middle Eastern oil to fuel the globalizing economy of the world. And while people were a lot more worried about it at $150 a barrel, uh, they're less worried about it now that it's below $50 a barrel. But the truth of the matter is I spent half my life fighting in the Middle East. My son, my daughter, my son-in-law have fought in the Middle East. They're well on their way to half of their life in the Middle East. Matter of fact, my son-in-law has spent more time fighting in the Middle East than my dad fought in World War II. And he's a captain in the 2nd Ranger Battalion. He's getting ready to go back again. We, we have depended upon these wonderful young people that wear the uniform of our country to pull a tremendous weight out there and we need never to lose sight of that. But my view is that our over-reliance on Middle Eastern oil at whatever price 
limits our geopolitical maneuver space. And we have to break out of this problem of having to react militarily everything, every time something goes wrong there because our global health depends upon it. And by the way, I'm not Pollyannish about this. I don't believe that there's a solution 10 years from now or 20 years from now. But at whatever price oil may be, we have got to develop alternatives, come up with some solution that satisfy, satisfies our energy needs in a way other than being uh, beholden to regimes in this part of the world. So those four issues, in my mind, require a strategy that confronts Sunni extremism, deters Iranian extremism, moves the Arab-Israeli peace process forward, and weans ourselves over time away from reliance on Middle Eastern oil. And those four strategic problems will be with President Obama for his four or eight years terms in office, and they'll be with the successor to President Obama and most likely the successor to the successor. So we're going to have to deal with this in a reasonable way, and we should beware of trying to control this part of the world. The Romans couldn't control it. The British couldn't control it. The French couldn't control it. The United States of America can't control it. But we can shape the outcome. We can blunt Sunni extremism. We can blunt Iranian ambitions. We can push the Arabs and the Israelis towards a better future, and we can come up with our great genius in this country with a better plan than we've developed so far about our over-reliance on oil. Fair enough. Well, uh, you've given us an optimistic place to start, and let's go from there. <laughs> the, but I am optimistic, very by the good. way. Okay, but let's, let's sort of begin with the issue of Sunni Islamic extremism, uh, because it is a major challenge, as you describe. It's not limited simply to the Middle East, but it's also an issue, obviously, in, in South Asia as we saw over uh, the weekend in, in Mumbai. Uh, but as you also know, a number of people have argued, most notably Sam Huntington, that we either are or are on the verge of a clash of civilizations. And the word you used was, we have to find a way to confront Islamic extremism. How do we do it? And how do we do it in a way that we don't become a self-fulfilling prophecy of ending up with a clash of civilizations? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. A lot of people have come to the conclusion that we're already in World War III. I don't share that view. I think that we need to prevent World War III. I think the clash of civilizations between us and the Islamic world would be the worst outcome that we could imagine. And it's clear to me that you can prevent it if you do a couple of different things. Uh, first and foremost, you have to recognize what, what I believe to be a fact, that the vast majority of Muslims in the world don't want the extremists to win. They have resisted extremism in many ways, in many places. In almost every one of these countries you see on the map behind me, they are fighting against the extremists. You have to demand that Muslim countries become more accountable to their people because in a world of increasing globalization promises and information availability, uh, regimes must become more accountable. And I think as that happens, if that happens, it will also do things. But you have to give the people in the region the ability to help themselves against the extremists. You have to count on them wanting to resist the tide. And with regard to Sunni extremism, you know, the ideological curve is kind of on the upward slope right now. They're certainly not ascended, but if you looked at Nazi Germany in 1929, you would have said, there's a bunch of crazy guys that have a plan, and they've written about it, and they've talked about it. They seem to be gaining some power, but we really can't give them any credit for being able to take over a sophisticated nation state like Germany, but they managed to figure out how to do it. and so. It's got to be in the back of our mind all the time to prevent this movement from becoming mainstream. Mm -hmm. And we do it in conjunction with the people in the region through common interests. And part of the problem that we have is because we have such a poor cultural understanding of this part of the world is that we've got to start figuring out how to bridge the cultural gap. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to me, and last night you and I were talking about this, this great confrontation we had with the Soviet Union 
you know, you could call on literally millions of Americans that knew the Russians, knew how to speak Russian, knew the Soviet Union, knew the underwear size of the leaders of the Politburo, and that were experts in every imaginable way about that particular problem. And you could call upon their expertise to help mobilize the nation to confront the problem. Of course, there were differences, and it was messy, you know, you know differences of opinion, et cetera. But, it, but when, when I called for experts in the military that knew Arabic, that understood the region and the religion and the culture, literally there were only 200 or so that we could call upon. Um, and that's way too few to deal with this big of a problem. And so it's my fervent hope that universities such as this and others, you know, will teach people Arabic, will talk to them about Islam, will give them exposure to the culture, will give them the opportunity to travel, and will continue not to close our doors to foreigners, but to open our doors in the hope that this dialogue can overcome the growing suspicion that seems to be happening. But as you talk about trying to deal with this, and it, I, the word you didn't use, but I sort of hear in the background is really trying to find a way to win the hearts and minds, to find some sort of uh, cultural understanding so that uh, we can be heard. And I'm left wondering, that takes immediately to the issue of Iraq, because obviously, uh, for much of the Middle East, it is a very sort of sore point having American troops uh, on Arab soil. And I guess the President Obama has pledged, reiterated in his talks yesterday, about his desire to withdraw troops, uh, from, combat troops from Iraq within 16 months. That was his campaign pledge. Uh, what, what is the status of uh, Iraq right now, a country you know very well? And is it feasible to talk about a withdrawal? Yeah, it's, it's certainly feasible to talk about a withdrawal. Uh, the Iraqis have certainly talked about a withdrawal. In the, negotiated SOFA that uh, recently approved by the Iraqi cabinet. Did you just and interject? SOFA is the Status of the Forces, status of forces agreement. agreement that's been approved by the Iraqi government to include their parliament. And it wasn't easy getting it through the parliament. Calls for a withdrawal by 2011, and it calls for US troops to be out of the cities uh, by next June. It's pretty ambitious in its own regard. Now, President Obama said 16 months, and of course, that shortens the time to 2011 to a considerable degree. It's feasible provided that governance in Iraq comes together. The security situation is much improved. I was there two months ago, and I was taken by the fact that uh, the security situation had improved, that Sunni Shia violence had abated to a considerable degree. Uh, that we had taken the bold step to pay our enemies to be part of the security solution as opposed to part of the fight. And while I was very heartened by that, I was also very concerned with the remaining political problems that exist in the country. Reconciliation between Sunni, Shia, and Kurd will take time, and it'll take effort. And so the question for us as we move ahead is whether or not this experiment of Iraqi self-governance and independence can move forward in a positive way. Uh, the Prime Minister is stronger now than he used to be. He's regarded with great suspicion by the Sunnis because he, they regard him as a, a Shia uh, extremist in some ways. Um, but if you look at Iraq, on the Sunni side you have Al-Qaeda over here, you have Shia, Iranian-backed extremists over here. And the problem has always been to keep people who want to be in the middle from flowing to the extremes. So it required militarily going after al-Qaeda and going after the Shia extremists. For a long time, we were able to do this, but we weren't able to do this. Uh, now that we've been able to have a more balanced approach to the problem, people are starting to move back towards the middle. But as General Petraeus said, who's a good friend of mine, he, he said, you know, this situation in Iraq is very fragile and it's very, it is potentially the gains we've made are reversible. And so you, you have to be careful about setting arbitrary timelines. You have to monitor it throughout this process. We're going to go into provincial elections there just within a couple of months. 
participation in those provincial elections and reaction to them will give us a clue as to whether or not political reconciliation will move forward positively. I can tell you for a fact, Iraqi Sunnis believe they're in the majority. But just, just I mean, they're only about 20% of the population. Right. Okay. It's a problem. You know, they believe that they're in the majority. Um, the Kurds believe that they have more people than they have. The Shia believe that they're in the majority and they want to keep the majority. There's got to be compromise. The question is, is compromise possible? Of course, you have uh, the extremist elements on both sides doing everything possible to attack people in the middle. A uh, very good news story is that the Iraqi army is starting to come together better. But no army is any good without having a government to be loyal to. And so how the government moves forward through provincial elections early next year and then national elections, I think, early the year after that, will determine whether Iraq will hold together or not. It's possible it won't. It's also important for us to understand under what conditions are we willing to help the Iraqis. Part of it has to be that they have to ask us for help at this stage of the game, which is not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but part of it also has to be that catastrophic failure has to be dealt with in a reasonable fashion. We should never return to occupation, in my view. Uh, but we should be able to help the legitimate Iraqi government through challenges, and we need to be prepared for that. The idea that violence is always going to go like this is false, just like the idea that it was always going to go like this was false. I mean, nothing in the mo Middle East moves in a straight line. The Middle East is filled with sine waves. And, you know, sometimes you're doing well, sometimes you're doing bad. Uh, but, I, I, you know, it's my impression that the team that, that President Obama, President-elect Obama has put together has realistic expectations mm -hmm. and uh, I think they'll adjust to the, the flow of the situation on the ground. I think having goals that are, that will be clearly art articulated once he takes office makes sense. Um, but in the world of global politics and power politics, a nation with as much power as the United States has to preserve its freedom of action, and we'll need to do that there. On this question of political reconciliation, and you rightly point out that you have at least three identifiable communities, Kurds, Sunni Iraqis, and Shia Iraqis that are grappling with, for power. And within those communities, there's some divisions as well. Uh, and political reconciliation is going to be key to long-term stability. Uh, that leads to a question, uh, which is, is there anything we should be doing as a country to help that political reconciliation take place? Or is it really a case of we sort of have to borrow a metaphor I have heard a lot, take our hands off the bicycle seat and let them try to make the best of it? Well, you know, I have kids, you have kids. I've taken my hands off the bicycle seat many times while the kids were learning how, and a couple times I regretted what happened. You know, and especially the scar on my son's forehead. Makes him look tough, <laughs> but he didn't like it. Um, I'm not sure that necessarily taught him how to ride the bike better. But when he was ready, he was ready. And, you know, the, the real problem with Iraq is coming to a conclusion about when they are ready. I think they are certainly more ready now than they have been before. Um, we have to take chances. They, they, it is their country. We have expended a lot of blood and treasure there. I'm cautiously optimistic that it can progress in a, in a positive manner. But, you know, it's not just the United States and Iraqis that are involved in this. What are the Iranians going to do? What are the Turks going to do? What are the Syrians and the Jordanians and the Saudis going to do? I mean, if the nations around Iraq come to the conclusion that it's in their best interest for a stable Iraq to emerge, then there's a much greater chance for success. If, on the other hand, they do like the Iranians have done for several years, which is prop up Sunni Shia extremist organizations, um, then I, I, I think it'll be a much tougher road. It's, uh, it's a difficult situation, but it's one that I believe firm diplomacy, uh, smart statecraft, um, capable military forces and trust in our Iraqi partners will eventually prove to be successful. But don't mistake what I say about successful. It doesn't mean 
that Swiss-style democracy will appear there. I, I think that that is a overreach that uh, we should be careful about. But will a nation state emerge there that is more accountable to its people? I think the chances are very good that that will happen. Um, it's interesting to me to watch the rest of the Arabs watch the televised Iraqi parliamentarian debates. And they watch it because they don't have anything like that in their own countries. And there is something that's going on here um, that could be good for our friends in the Arab world. Uh, but then again, who knows how it's going to come out. But I remain cautiously optimistic that the Iraqis can find their way uh, to a better future. Uh, it, like I say, it won't be Switzerland, but it might be better than the average Middle Eastern state. You mentioned uh, neighbors, and there's obviously one neighbor of great interest to Washington, that's Iran. Uh, and you've talked about uh, well, your second great strategic challenge is uh, stopping the excesses of Shia nationalism. Uh, as you know, in Washington, there are a lot of people who are worried that, uh, to borrow the verb you used, uh, the Iranians can't be deterred. Where do you come down on the whole, they can be deterred, they can't be deterred debate? Uh, I come down that they can be deterred. I think we have deterred them. But I think it's very hard to deter them. And I think we have to uh, be clear in what we're trying to do. And I, I also believe you have to talk to the Iranians, just like we talked to the Soviet Union. We, we talked to the Soviet Union that we were prepared to destroy them upon a launch warning uh, just by the, the order of the President of the United States. We lived in that hair trigger world and we found that the only way to live in it was to talk to our potential adversary. And I believe that's what you have to do with the Iranians. They're not nice people to talk to. But you know, we've created this image of Iran of being some sort of a super state out there. The average Iranian exists on about $2,000 a, a year. Uh, their armed forces are not very capable. They're uh, very clever in their use of special forces and intelligence forces. They've developed a missile uh, system that can threaten many of the regional states, but it's not very accurate. Um, they are very vulnerable to the falling price of oil. They can't provide for gasoline for their own people, and yet they're prepared to waste all their money on developing nuclear weapons because they think it makes it them safer. The truth of the matter is developing nuclear weapons makes them weaker. I know that they have incredibly childish rhetoric coming from uh, their president, uh, Ahmadi Inajad, but the, the truth of the matter is he's not the guy that has his finger on the nuclear button if they ever get it. Uh, it's a very complex state with many different factions. Uh, there's something to be said for the fact that I can, I think, say this without insulting our Middle Eastern friends in the audience. You know, the Middle Eastern world is a, a world of, of uh, people that know how to buy and sell things. I know this. I'm from a Lebanese family. I mean, you know, my own cousins would try to sell me stuff. <laughs> and then when I'd say no, they'd drop the price. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's, it's a part of the world where you're always playing brinkmanship, but you're always willing to find a price. It's a part of the world where compromise is possible, and it's a part of the world where the Bazari merchants of Tehran have a very big say. And one of the things they don't want to have happen is war. They don't want to have their families and their culture destroyed over some obscure Shia ideological point of view. And I doubt that they'll move in that direction. I don't see Iran as a suicide state. I see them as dangerous, expansionistic, but deterrable. Now, this creates a more difficult problem for the Israelis than it does for us. And certainly Israel will do what it has to do to protect its own interests. But even there, the Israeli ability to defend itself should not be underestimated. So um, Al-Qaeda is hard because you can't deter it, because it's not attached it's to no a nation state. Address, as they say. That's right. Uh, Iran is different. It can be dealt with in a, a reasonable fashion. And I think it will take an awful lot of diplomatic skill. And I also believe we shouldn't take any options off the table. President Obama needs to have in mind his worst case scenario. And that needs to include the use of military force. But 
I don't think it'll come to that. And I also believe that the Iranian nation is tired of the mullahs. They've been under their leadership since 1979. The cost of living has risen. The freedom of expression has dropped, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's an awful lot of difficulties. And I think over time, that government either reforms into being more responsible or that it goes away in a revolution. Now, all the more reason not to want them to have a nuclear weapon, by the way, if they become un unstable. But we shouldn't fear Iran. Uh, we should deter Iran. We should make it very clear to them what we expect of them. We should be prepared to fight them if necessary. But I can guarantee you, they don't want to fight us. I know this from having been the military commander in the region. When American ships showed up, they went away. When American planes showed up, they went away. I mean, they, they look for finding proxies to fight their battle, not fight a direct battle. And so, you know, we should deal with them as is natural for the United States of America from a position of strength. If we let our diplomacy be guided by ideological rhetoric of our own, we will move down some very strange roads. You, you mentioned the importance of talking to the Iranians. And right now, there's a debate that's broken out in Washington uh, about the wisdom of talking to your enemies. Now, obviously, uh, President-elect Obama on the campaign trail talked about how he was willing to have conversations uh, without preconditions, but not necessarily without preparations. Uh, what needs to be done before we talk to the Iranians? And one, one argument is that what we should do is begin at low levels. Uh, another argument is, yeah. most recently, Brookings and the Council on Foreign Relations released a joint uh, report arguing for swift steps to go and talk yeah. to the Iranians, put everything on the table. Well, look, if you'll excuse the metaphor, I think we should date before we have sex. OK? OK. And that means? This, this is a red state, so that's probably a good idea. Well, I mean, I'm from Nevada. It's, okay. You know, Nevada's pretty red, okay. too, although not in this election. <laughs> um, we need to be clear that we are moving towards a period of talking. But it doesn't have to happen all at once. It doesn't have to be the President of the United States wanting to engage immediately with the President of Iran. I think there's all sorts of ways to deal with the Iranians, ranging from cultural exchanges to uh, discussions between diplomats. By the way, to say that we're not talking to the Iranians is not completely correct, by the way. Our, our diplomats have been talking to the Iranians, and they've been doing it out of necessity because of Iranian activities in uh, uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And so talking to a country doesn't mean that you're being nice to the country. Talking to the country means that you're expressing your point of view and, and what I, as a military commander, was always concerned about in this part of the world is that there would be an incident that would move towards, uh, you know, caused by miscalculation that would move us to war unnecessarily. And believe me, it's easy to get in that position in this world at this time. And so I was very concerned about that. If, if American Marines had been the subject of the British Marines, you know, if it had been British American Marines instead of the British Marines that had been captured by the Iranians, um, we would have very quickly moved into a confrontational state. And so I think um, making sure that, that we understand one another, just like any two adversaries. You do this, I'm going to do that. A and then also clearly building an international coalition that says to the Iranians, don't procure or develop a nuclear weapon. It's not in your interest. It's not in anybody's interest. And there will be penalties. I think holding that together is extremely important. Um, and then ultimately, when you cross a line that we can't stand, be prepared for the worst. Uh, in terms of talking to the Iranians, one way in sort of standard diplomacy 101 is to focus on common interest and build from there. And it would seem that the United States and Iran would have some common interest given Iran's next door neighbor, Afghanistan. Uh, and obviously, the United States has a large number of troops in Afghanistan right now. Uh, earlier this year, uh, General uh, Jim Jones, who's uh, the nominee to be, not nominee, the appointee to be uh, 
National Security Advisor to President Obama, uh, said, let me quote him, make no mistake, NATO is not winning in Afghanistan. I guess I really have two questions. Do you share his assessment? And whether you do or not, what's the right strategy for Afghanistan? Well, I know Jim Jones very well. As a matter of fact, I worked for him in 1991 in northern Iraq. So I, I have great respect for the man. Um, not winning is an interesting problem that we've had because everybody's got a different view of what winning is. And winning in the context of counterinsurgency, counterterrorism, ideological movements, unaccountable governments, ungoverned spaces, is not exactly winning on marching to Berlin and destroying Nazi Germany or taking out Imperial Japan. Too often the United States view of the world is we're gonna march on Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, unconditional surrender, we're gonna win, we're gonna have victory parade and it's all gonna be over. But what's going on in the Middle East today is not susceptible to those kind of pressures and we should try to keep from getting to that point. If we ever get to that point, it's World War III. And we shouldn't have to come to that point. But I would say the most important thing to understand about Afghanistan, first and foremost, the armed forces of the United States is only so big. It's already stretched, the Army and the Marine Corps in particular. It was inevitable when we put more pressure in Iraq and made the decision to go into Iraq with more fo forces that we would have less flexibility to deal with a changing situation in Pakistan or in Afghanistan. Uh, not only did the situation change militarily in Afghanistan, but the political situation in Pakistan changed, mm -hmm. making the Pakistani side of the border much more of a resilient safe haven than we had seen before. So my view is that our focus shouldn't actually be on Afghanistan. Okay. It needs to be on Pakistan. The problem isn't Afghanistan. The problem is Pakistan. Um, Afghanistan, the NATO forces, American forces, can deal with the military threat of the Taliban. If, if NATO thinks that it's going to be confined to the, confined to the boundaries of Afghanistan for its operational space and its political maneuver room, it's doomed to failure. Just like the Soviet Union was doomed in Afghanistan because it was unable to get at the safe haven in Pakistan. And so, you know, the, the key for us needs to be to leverage the Pakistani government in a way that makes sense, and I'll be darned if I know how to do it, to, to cause them to gain greater control over what's going on on their side of the border. Uh, Pakistan is a mess right now. Pakistan not only can't control troops from the Taliban and Al-Qaeda coming from uh, the federally administered tribal areas, Waziristan, et cetera, uh, into Afghanistan, but they apparently can't control, although I don't know for sure uh, where this group from uh, that hit Mumbai came from, they c apparently can't control linkages between a well-known Pakistani terrorist group, Lashkar-e-Taiba, and the people that attacked Mumbai. So if you can't control, if, if terrorists are forcing you into a two-front war that you mm -hmm. choose not to fight, right. you've got to do something to regain control. And the Pakistani body politic knows that the extremists are a mortal danger to them. So what then is the solution that brings Afghanistan, Pakistan, NATO, the United States, and the rest of the international community together to control this crazy part of this international border known as um, the Afghan-Pakistan border area. Now, how many of you have been out to the Sierra Nevadas? Anybody been in the Reno, Nevada area? And you know, if you go from like Reno, Nevada down to Bakersfield and then north from Reno, Nevada up the, to Crater Lake, that's about an area as big as we're talking about. It's a little bit narrower in California, Nevada. Matter of fact, my wife and I chose to retire in Gardnerville, Nevada, because we're from out there. And it's an area just like the Pakistan-Afghanistan border area. All the Nevadans are very heavily armed. <laughs> they hate the federal government, and they're prone to building militias. 
<laughs> and they're trying to prevent infiltration from California. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that this is one of the most rugged and difficult parts of the world to control. And the Pakistanis have helped us. Pakistan, as a matter of fact, has taken out more senior leader al-Qaeda people than any other nation on earth, to include us. And, and, and Pakistan has allowed the reinforcement of American forces through their territory, the resupply of American forces through their territory in, or, in order to be able to, to fight the fight in Afghanistan. But Pakistan's not in control of its own institutions. They're not in control of what's going on in the border area. And ultimately, we've got to all figure out how to help the Pakistanis help themselves. What makes the situation particularly worrisome about Pakistan, and by the way, I didn't lose much sleep over Iraq or Afghanistan. You know, we, our troops were doing well. Our commanders were doing well. They knew what they were doing. I understand the sentiments here in the country, how, how politically they charged they became. But we always seemed as if we knew how to deal with the situation very inelegant, elegantly, no doubt, but, but it was moving towards a, a, an outcome that we could probably live with. But Pakistan is a nuclear armed state. And if Pakistan goes down to some form of violent extremism that causes the government to topple, the military to turn, uh, or God forbid, the government to become extremist, then we have uh, what I can only describe as a nightmare scenario unfolding. Nuclear arms in the hands of people that have expressed interests of using them against our interests or against us here uh, in a way that would be very difficult to defend against because they would be delivered by terrorist groups as opposed to missiles. And so there's a urgent need to deal with Pakistan. And we have yet to figure out uh, what the right path is. Uh, there are those who say invade Waziristan and go get the bad guys. That's easy to say, it's hard to do. Especially if Pakistan then decides they're going to cut off supplies to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I mean, you only have to look at the map to understand what that would create. And so, you know, I'm, uh, I'm very concerned about the situation in Pakistan. And if I were advising the President of the United States elect, which I am not, uh, nor did I advise any campaign because I believe soldiers need to be apolitical, not political, um, I, I would tell them your number one priority needs to be attacking the stability of Pakistan in a way that makes it more stable, more part of the international situation. Uh, uh, situation here in this part of the world and um, less accommodating to uh, the extremists. There's been talk for a long time about uh, the Pakistani intelligence service being in the pay of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. I think that's that uh, undoubtedly there are corrupt officials that help the Taliban and Al-Qaeda as a result of money pouring in from the Persian Gulf to uh, extremist causes, but I don't believe that as an institution uh, that it is working against its own government in order to support the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. But it's an extremely complicated situation, and Pakistan is not a unitary nation state oh, that's, any that's more than, than, than Iraq is. You know, there's Pashtuns, there's Sindhis, there's Punjabis, there's Baluchis, and there's a host of other peoples that are not quite sure that their future is in this unitary state of Pakistan. And that's especially pronounced among the Pashtuns that are not only fighting on the Pakistani side of the border, but the Afghan side of the border. And to a certain extent, we, we need to come to grips with what's happening down there uh, and not just regard it only as a manifestation of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. It might also be uh, nascent Pashtun um, national Is it far-fetched to start thinking about the possibility of, in essence, the struggle in the, in the territories becoming one, a secessionist movement? Well, you know, when I talk about this, I'm sure happy I'm retired now. <laughs> you know, it, it sometimes bothers me to actually articulate what's going on in that part of the world, but I think it's shapeable. 
Well, uh, then uh, let's sort of go back. Uh, we'll go back to the western part of the region and talk about uh, another issue that uh, seems to be uh, difficult to solve, and that's the uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace process. You mentioned uh, this is, I guess, your third uh, strategic issue that the Obama administration is going to have to deal with. And you emphasize, I think, quite rightly, rightly uh, the importance of starting early rather than waiting late and trying to rush up against a deadline. Uh, but how does one actually go from that broad goal to decisions on the ground? Uh, because I, I, would, I know many people who would say uh, this has been an issue for a very long time, and it's likely to be an issue for a very long, long time. Uh, and our ability to make progress is pretty limited. How do we deal well, with that? Well, if we think in, in our typical five-second soundbite way, we won't get there. We'll never get there. I mean, in this part of the world that you see up here, they, they're, they think in 500-year chunks. And, and there's a cultural disconnect. What we have to do is move the process forward towards a logical conclusion that protects the Israeli democracy, that establishes a better future for Palestinians, and that diffuses what will undoubtedly lead to a much worse Arab-Israeli conflict in the future that might even be nuclear armed uh, in a way that can allow Israel to integrate into the nation states of the region and the Arabs to move beyond this never-ending problem. I think it would do much to lessen the incentive for Arab extremists to become suicide bombers, join Al-Qaeda, et cetera, et cetera. But again, I'm not, uh, I don't regard the Arab-Israeli conflict as the heart of the matter. It's part of the problem. It needs to be moved forward and with, with subtle and constant diplomacy. I think it can happen. But again, you know, we're not the only state in the middle of this. The Israelis have a right to choose their own future. The Israelis will do what they need to do to defend their vital interests, just like we will. And the Israelis are going to choose a new prime minister here pretty soon. And that prime minister could be very aggressive, Bibi Netanyahu, if, that, if he's the one who emerges. Or it could be some other unexpected compromise candidate. I, I don't know. I don't know Israeli politics well enough to know. I know that Israeli military leaders are very concerned about their performance against Hezbollah. It unnerved them. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, it's essential that this problem be moved towards one of talking as opposed to fighting. And uh, it will take the leadership of the United States to move it forward. We have been close on many opportunities and occasions to be in within what we call in the infantry the last tactical mile. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, or the last tactical hundred yards or the last tactical yard. You know, it's a, that point where you know that the breakthrough is coming, but you have to put in that extra energy necessary to make the breakthrough. But it's, it's hard, it's slow, it's difficult, and it will require an awful lot of courage on the part of our administration uh, but it will also require courage on the part of the Israelis and uh, the Palestinians. You know, when, if you, th you think about these four challenges that I presented, you may or may not agree with them, but they do interlock, interlock and intersect. A and you, you have to work on all of them in a way that's complementary, synchronized, and coordinated. I think we have the ability to do that. But it will require some very, very deft diplomacy and it will also require um, some give on the Palestinian side. I mean, look, you know, we, we, the United States of America, insisted upon elections in the Palestinian territories. A and we insisted upon elections when all the evidence was to the contrary that Hamas might emerge as a power to be reckoned with, and sure enough, they did. So, you know, we shouldn't confuse democracy with voting. We, we, we need to understand that democracy first has to require accountability. And, and then maybe you can get to free and fair elections. But we, we need not to jump too soon. You know, this part of the world's been 
fighting for 5,000 years for a reason. And what we need to do is give them a chance to quit fighting for the next 5,000 years. But it'll take them some time to get used to it. Let me ask one more question that I want to bring in the audience. And that's, I want to talk about your favorite institution. Uh, West United Point, United, United States, States Military Army. Academy, in their upcoming <laughs> victory against Navy. <laughs> Go Army! Yeah. Op Are there any Navy people in the audience? <laughs> Uh, it, it's been too long. You have to even admit that. It's time to share. It's time to share. Yeah. I, I, I mean, want... Army's not in any danger of upsetting the BCS, okay? <laughs> I don't think the BCS is terribly popular in this room. So. <laughs> okay. um, I, I want to ask about the health of the Army. Uh, from all reports I read, uh, morale and troops on the, in the battle zones is quite high. Uh, right. On the other hand, uh, my friends who sort of worry about mi military readiness, State of training, retention rates. So there are a lot of alarms being sounded. What, what is your sense of the health of the U.S. Army today? Fragile. It's fragile, and we need to admit that it's fragile, and we need to take whatever action that, that we have to to make it more resilient. If you agree that this is a long war proposition back here, doesn't mean, by the way, that it needs to be a long war at the level of force that we have now that force actually needs to come down. We need to help people in the region help themselves build counter-terrorist and counter-insurgency capability. And when they can't do it, we should use our very capable counter-terrorist forces when we know where the enemy is to go get them. I'm, we, we just can't let this, you know, you can, you can walk away from Al-Qaeda, ladies and gentlemen, but they're not gonna walk away from us. So the question will be, how do we use our resources in a way that keeps the enemy on a defensive back foot. Now the Army, what about the health of the Army? My son-in-law hates me to do this, but I'm gonna use him as an example. Uh, 1998 graduate of West Point. He's been in Afghanistan for a year and three different year tours of duty in Iraq. He was wounded in Iraq. He's getting ready to go back again. He's married to my daughter, who's a soldier's daughter. She, you know, she was used to me traveling and fighting all over the world, which I did. Um, and so she's pretty tough. They got two kids, and they want to know wh when are they going to be able to have their peace dividend? You know, wh what is it that's going to keep him in the Army? Now, it's not about the equipment of the Army that makes it so good. It's the people of the Army. And it's precisely the captains, like my son-in-law, and the sergeants, and the sergeant first classes, and the staff sergeants that make the Army this tactical instrument that's unequaled. I'm so proud of what the Army and the Marine Corps have done in this fight. You know, it's been a tough fight, but we've been at war for seven years. They've never lost a tactical action in seven years. But the only way we'll keep them that way is if we keep the mid-grade officers. So we either have to make the Army bigger or we got to bring down the, the troop commitment Otherwise, we'll risk breaking the Army. Equipment, we can buy. People, we've got to nurture. We have to develop. We have to lead. And we have to sustain. Uh, the Army's doing pretty darn good against this particular enemy. But if the Army ever starts falling apart, if the junior officers leave in mass and the non-commissioned officers leave in mass, then we'll start making the battle even. And when we do, it'll be our worst nightmare. Fair enough. I'm going to invite the audience, if anyone has questions, to ask them. I believe we have a microphone out there, and if you could wait till the microphone is brought forward. Uh, Jim, if I could, could I have two minutes yep. to show a slide that Certainly. I would like to show on Al-Qaeda? Um, it used to be I had 50,000 people to move the slides forward. Now it's me and the machine. I don't want to talk about this. This is what I want to talk about. Just bear with me, if you will. Why is it that al-Qaeda is so dangerous and so um, difficult for us to deal with? First of all, it doesn't have a nation state that it's attached to. And secondly, it has a very interesting interpretation of Islam, which most Muslims will say has nothing to do with mainstream Islam. Uh, but it is seventh century in outlook and it is effective to the disaffected, it is affected in, effective in bringing the disaffected few to the team. And when you're talking about 
a lot of people. It doesn't have to be a big team. Now, Al-Qaeda has managed to project military power to hit the United States of America, Britain, um, Algeria. I, I mean, I could just name country after country. And one of the ways they've been able to do it is network themselves in a way that is much more effective than we have networked ourselves in our own military. They are connected by the virtual space in the internet. They may have a 7th century idea of the world, but they have a 21st century way of using available technology that allows them to recruit, train, proselytize. You can use PayPal to contribute to their organizations. You know, I, I mean, it's a very interesting problem that we have here with their ability to use the virtual space as a way to organize, train, equip. They also have people that finance them, facilitate. Um, the military can get at these yellow clouds down here, their bases, their places for action. But they, they're not trying to defeat us militarily. They, they know that they can't stand up to the pressures of the US Army and Air Force, Marine Corps, Navy. But they, they do believe that they can break our will to continue the fight and that in the long term, that will allow their, their, their ideology to become ascended. In other words, avoid defeat. That's the classic guerrilla strategy, as I think most people understand. And so um, they've organized themselves in a pretty capable manner. And in order to get at this enemy, you've got to find them first. And finding them has been difficult. We do find quite a few of them, and we have put quite a few of them out of action. Uh, but ultimately, if you want to win the battle in Iraq or Afghanistan, the Iraqis and the Afghans, or in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, the Pakistanis and the Saudis have to win it because they'll know how to find them, they'll know how to infiltrate the cells, and they'll be able to take them down. To a certain extent, that's happening in Saudi Arabia, uh, but it's certainly not happening in Pakistan. So the question for us is, if you just push around this thing with military force here or or you know some sort of action to stop credit card movement there, um, you really don't get the effect that you need. You have to synchronize national hard power and soft power, economic, political, military, educational, informational, uh, in a way that makes it more difficult for th this ideology to take hold in, in the region. And that requires an international effort along this periphery. And over time, you squeeze it down. And, and you just make the ideology unpalatable. The ideology, to a certain extent, makes itself unpalatable, right. uh, but not unpalatable, uh, unpalatable enough. Uh, the Nazis figured out how to break through. The Bolsheviks figured out how to break through. We shouldn't think that evil technology or evil ideologies are um, not capable of becoming mainstream, because our historical experience says they are. OK, thanks. Fair enough. Questions? Uh, this gentleman down here in the front. Ready for the microphone, please? That way, for the webcast, which will be available in about a week, people can hear the question you ask. Um, in Saudi Arabia, they practice a particularly extreme form of um, Islam, which is uh, Wahhabi Islam. And um, you know, most of the hijackers in 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia. Osama bin Laden is Saudi. So um, you mentioned a lot of these extremist countries, but what do you think needs to be done um, in Saudi Arabia to prevent uh, the rise of extremism? Yeah. First of all, I'd say Wahhabi Islamic faith does not necessarily in and of itself need to be extreme. And there are many people I know in Saudi Arabia that are uh, not extreme, that have fought with us, fought with us many times in the Middle East and continue to work with us today against Al Qaeda. But there is a clerical class within the country that has adopted extreme behavior. And the regime, over time, has elected to have some of the extremists, rather than be arrested and dealt with inside the country, they've pushed them out of the country. And where did they go? They went to the Horn of Africa. And they went to the Fatah, the federally administered tribal areas of Pakistan. And when governments are either unable or unwilling to educate their own people, people are hungry for education. They welcome these people with open arms. 
And it should be no surprise to us that we wake up 20 years hence to find these areas uh, radicalized in a way that makes it difficult. Ultimately, the Saudi Arabian government has to come to grips with not only what's happening within its own borders, but what its citizens are doing outside of its own borders. And that's the bridge that they need to cross. I believe King Abdullah, and I know him and I respect him, has a very clear view of what has to be done, um, whether or not he's able to make people grasp a hold of that in a way that's good for the kingdom is, is hard to know. I have faith in uh, Saudi Arabia that it can move forward. I don't think it needs to be the vanguard of the enemy. I think Saudi Arabia needs to join the rest of the international community in a way that makes the international community safer and more stable. I think there are many problems ahead. They've done a good job inside Saudi Arabia once they decided to fight. They actually have a very, very effective psychological campaign against extremists that are going on today. Um, interestingly enough, a, a suicide bomber blew himself up and failed to complete the task in, uh, inside Iraq. He was alive, burned very badly, tried to blow up a tanker truck in front of a girls' school in Iraq. And so uh, he was evacuated back home to Saudi Arabia. and. The Saudis have him on television talking about why what he did was wrong, uh, how he was recruited, and you know, it, it, it's a very effective campaign to make people understand that this is wrong. However, there's a problem with uh, the price of oil being down low, isn't there? And that is that it creates within the dispossessed classes of Saudi Arabia um, more of a feeling of not being part of a kingdom that's moving forward. So. There's a lot of difficulties that they have, um, but I believe that the partnership between Saudi Arabia and the United States that has existed should continue to exist, and that we need to help them help themselves against this collective enemy that we're fighting. Um, Islam, by the way, in my view, is not an evil religion, and we shouldn't look at it that way. But we should understand that there are evil elements within the religion that would like to hijack it. And that's how I view what's going on with Al-Qaeda. I mean, certainly my, my Muslim friends hate for me to even use the word Islamic in this epic fight that is going on out here. But the enemy describes itself in those terms. Um, I understand there's a separation of church and state in the United States. But in the Islamic world, there's not. And so, you know. First and foremost, we need to understand who they are, what they stand for, and I believe a lot of this battle is about mutual respect. And if we can bridge that gap better, and we need to do it soon, we'll have a greater chance of winning. It was instructive to me when I was a commander out there, and I came back for one of my torture sessions in front of the Senate of the United States, um, that there was a controversy going on about whether or not we, we could allow one of our ports to be run by the Dubai Ports Corporation. And, and you don't find better friends of the United States than within the Dubai Ports Corporation. And so, I, but it, it showed me that it's not just their problem of viewing us as a civilizational threat, that there are many people here in the United States that have come to that conclusion as well. Uh, we better have a pretty strong dialogue about this, about what we really think, so we get ready for the next 50 years or so that are ahead of us. Oh, let's go all the way. To Great the, question, by the way. We'll go to the back. Yep. Uh, you mentioned that Israel has the right to defend itself, its interests. Um, do the Iranians have the right to defend your, their interests? And if they, have, if they do, what are the legitimate interests that you would grant them? Thank you. Yeah, I, I actually believe that every nation that's a responsible member of the international community has the right to defend itself against threats to its vital national interest. I think that a attack on Iran is not unlike the one that Iraq perpetrated back in the 80s, was certainly uh, well within the rights of the Iranians to defend. I believe that the Iranians have the right for a better and more prosperous future for their people. I believe that the Iranians have the right to 
um, move forward into the 21st century in a way that's good for not only the region but for themselves. I don't believe that the Iranians have the right to establish militias in Iraq, Lebanon, Afghanistan, eastern Saudi Arabia that are intent upon destabilizing the region. Gentleman over here. Uh, sir, I'm a sergeant in the uh, Army National Guard, and I, w I had a question. Thank you for your service. I, we you, didn't sir. plant him there. I want you to know that. Yeah, no, excellent. Not. No, I did not. And uh, having served one tour in Iraq thus far, uh, earlier you mentioned the 200. I spent in five years in that part of the world. <laughs> earlier, sir, you mentioned the 200 regional experts in the military that you could call upon shortly <laughs> after uh, September the 11th. And I, I know from having served in the Army that institutional change, the change in institutional culture, is not something that's easy to do. It takes time. And so what have been the attempts and the difficulties to change the institutional culture of the Army to a counterinsurgency uh, environment, counterinsurgency operations? Yeah, thanks. Great question. I, I believe that the, uh, the Army is very focused on counterinsurgency and counterterrorism. The danger for the Army, of course, is to keep getting ready for Iraq well beyond Iraq. The ultimate insurance policy of our freedom and our values is our army. Our army has to fight and win wars. And we need to pay attention to that. I, I don't know what the future may bring for us. It's possible we'll go to war with Iran. Possible we'll go to war with North Korea. It's possible that something could transpire with a Russian move in the middle of Eastern Europe that causes war between us and Russia. It's possible that some distant future uh, we have a confrontation with the Chinese. It's possible that the unexpected will happen and that we'll need our army to defend us. And we've got to make sure that that army is first and foremost ready to fight and win. Not all future wars will be counterinsurgencies. At some point or other, we'll have to fight for our life. We've had to do it before. We'll have to do it again. And so the army needs to stay balanced. The Army probably got unbalanced as a result of our great victory in the 1991 Gulf War. It was relatively bloodless. It was um, you know, swift, precise. It was all the things that we would like a short, quick war to be. Um, but it, when you're facing counterinsurgency, you have to adapt tactics, techniques, and procedures. I believe we've done that. I believe sometimes it's slower than we would like it to happen. But I know of no better group of people to deal with these sorts of problems today uh, than our soldiers. And it's, it's, I'm gratified to know that there are cultural experts that we're forming. They're called soldiers and Marines and sailors and airmen that know this part of the world. And while uh, some of them want nothing to do with it, most of them understand that we're, we're going to have to figure out how to move forward in this part of the world. What I'd like to know is how can we get more diplomats? How can we get more economic experts? How we can get uh, private enterprise? How we can get the rest of our people to understand that this just can't be a soldier's war. We buy you time. That's the best we can do. We buy time for something else to happen. And what bothers me about where we are right now is that the something else hasn't manifested itself in a clear way. And that needs to be economic, diplomatic, informational, educational. It needs to be an effort. And oh, by the way, you know, this has to manifest itself at a time where our national and international economic system is having great difficulties. Is this strategy affordable under current circumstances? No. But can it be abandoned under current circumstances? No. Therefore, this is my opinion, of course. Therefore. You know, how are we going to deal with it? And, and my view is we have good counterinsurgency capabilities, but we want to get away from insurgency. We need the local nations to deal with their insurgent problems. What I think will be necessary to develop further will be our counterterrorist capability. And that requires a more agile intelligence system that finds the enemy. We have this idea, find, fix, finish exploit, and then back to fine. <laughs> it's a cycle. 
The problem is that if you don't get this first find, that the fix and the finish and the exploit go awful slow. Now, we developed a pretty good system for getting after Al-Qaeda in both Afghanistan and Iraq that was very, very rapid turn on the terrorists. But ultimately, there needs to be much more international cooperation and interagency cooperation to be able to deal with these problems efficiently, effectively. Professor Cooperman. Hi there, sir. It's uh, great to have you here, and I've uh, been a big fan of yours for a long time. I think if you'd been in charge of things, we might not be in a couple of these messes that we're in. But in any case... Well, I was in charge of them, and we are in a mess. <laughs> you, you, you were in charge on the military side. I don't think that you uh, decided to get us into the wars. Okay. Um, but my question is about a, a slightly more obscure area uh, uh, in your AOR, and that is uh, Somalia. In a couple of years, something very interesting happened there, which is that the state, which had been a failed state for 15 years, uh, had been ungoverned space for 15 years, all of a sudden started to unfail. Uh, and that is, power started to be consolidated by this thing called the Islamic courts movement in the center and south of the country. And rather than chaos, now you had order. Rather than a lack of commerce, now you had commerce. And we had concerns about this group because it had some alleged links to Al-Qaeda or Islamist extremism. And we, at that point, we had two one of two choices. We could try and work with them and wean them from any connections to Al-Qaeda, or we could try and do regime change militarily. And my read of things is, is we went for option B. We worked with the Ethiopians. We backed up the Ethiopians. Ethiopia invaded Somalia. And in my opinion, it's been an absolute disaster. First of all, humanitarian catastrophe. Second of all, renewal of civil war. And third of all, guess what? The Islamic courts are winning. The Ethiopians are leaving. And the Islamic courts are now radicalized because we attacked them militarily. So um, is there a lesson to be learned here uh, about how we use or don't use military force with Islamic, with Islamic extremism? And is there even a lesson here maybe that we should apply or think of applying to Pakistan? Thanks. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> um, first of all, the, the Somalia problem is a, a pretty, pretty difficult one for us to be able to, to understand. And I, I agree with almost everything that you postulated. And, and I think that there are some let. By the way, there's a lesson in everything we've done out here over the past seven years that some of which have been good lessons, others of which have been not so good lessons. With regard to Somalia, I, I would bring you back to, was it 1991? I think I was there in December of 1991. And I, I was there in December and January of 1991. And I came away from there saying that this humanitarian problem is going to turn into a military problem. And I think the biggest lesson is we intervene in these important problems in a way that don't have well-defined end states. If we intervened in Somalia in order to feed starving people, we fed starving people and then we decided to shape its future without a clear outcome and then we got stung in the Battle of Mogadishu and then we left. Part of what that taught me is that we need to have a little bit more stick to -itiveness once we get involved in this thing. It does require a certain amount of debate within our own country as to whether or not it's something that we should do. And so Somalia has been a haven for piracy, a haven for lawlessness, a haven for drugs. A haven, I, I mean, you can go through every ill in the book. And you, you know what was going on in the period with whether or not to have the help, uh, have the Ethiopians uh, be supported was whether or not the government that they backed could become ascendant or not. And the government that they backed, by the way, happened to be the government that we backed. But as always, the problem is, you know, once the Ethiopians failed, what was step B? What were we going to do next? And yeah, I, I think the way that you've described the situation is exactly right. Now, by the way, if we think that this part of the world, now, General Petraeus has gotten a break from the president because the president took 
uh, from Sudan south away from him and given it to a new military command called Africa Command. Now, if you think CENTCOM's got trouble, think about Africa Command. It's not just Somalia. That's ungoverned space. Uh, Northern Somalia is, is governing itself fairly effectively, interestingly enough. But Southern Somalia is a mess. We've had these terrible riots in Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Goma, Eastern Congo. I mean, the whole central section of Africa, not to mention the Darfur and Sudan. You know, this is not just a problem of backing government, it's a problem of, uh, or backing or not backing government. It, it's a, a problem of, of future genocide. I believe the only reason we haven't been in Darfur is because we're so overextended, we can't afford to be there. But the people that are in Darfur, the UN and the African Union, are not achieving any results to speak of. So the question for us will be, as the world gets smaller, becomes more global, can we put up with places out there that are falling apart to the point where they affect the rest of us? In the past, we could. I, I ask this question rhetorically. I don't know the answer. But I do know that there are limits to our own power as well. But the international community can't simply ignore bad things uh, because uh, of the inconvenience of what, um, of, of having to commit resources to help clean up the mess. I, I think our international and national institutions aren't robust enough to deal with the 21st century challenges. I, I think that we're going to have to help more countries help themselves and come into the 21st century in a way that at least provides the most modicum of security. And this is going to require getting more involved in Africa. Not in great power rivalry with the Chinese, by the way, but in a way that doesn't allow Rwanda, Burundi, and Eastern Congo to melt down again. And it appears to me they're melting down again. So, I mean, the challenges out there are many. The resources out there are few. And it's difficult to convince our population that the world is so small these days that we can't ignore it. We have to be part of the solution. Part of the solution, by the way, is not military. You know, why is it that over the past eight years we have chosen, and I'm not being critical of the administration. I served the administration as a soldier loyally and faithfully. But I would say reaching for the military instrument of power too soon is a mistake. There are other instruments of national and international power that can be brought to bear to deal with some of these problems uh, in a more effective manner than we've been willing to countenance. And I think it's, we've, we've got to come to grips with that. Will the new administration do that? I don't know. We've got plenty of problems. Uh, but I, you know, I, I appreciate your description of the Somalia debacle. And I believe that the only way to eradicate piracy emanating from Somalia, besides sinking pirate ships, which I think we should do, if we can find them, getting back to the fine part of the equation, it is to ultimately bring Somalia back into the community of nations to figure out how to help it help itself. Anarchy anywhere is bad everywhere. But maybe that's just a soldier in me talking. Down here toward the front. Thank you very much for being with us, uh, General, and sharing your views. <clears throat> I have really two questions, and you could choose to answer one or both. Uh, the first one is your intimacy with the uh, Muslim community. I'd like you to comment on the fact that they're not very vocal in this situation. Um, I'm not a master of comparative religions, but they all have the basic foundation of doing good and being kind to one another, and yet the extremists seem to be winning. Why are not they more vocal? And the second one is, do you have a comment on the return to some degree of a draft that would not only be a benefit to, I think, to our, uh, our youth, but also to the nation? How much time do we have there? Are we, are we approaching the we're, witching we're, hour? We're going to the wrapping it up. <laughs> Thank you for uh, tough questions. Um, so the draft in the Muslims. Why aren't the Muslims more vocal? By the way, you know, my upbringing is Christian Lebanese. And I, uh, I'm, 
I wouldn't want anybody to think that I'm Muslim. I'm, I'm not, but I respect the religion. I've studied the religion. And the, the religion has been pretty good about dealing with extremism within its ranks. It, it's, uh, I mean, there's a history of extremism from time to time, but I, I think that most Muslims believe that what's happening with Al-Qaeda is an aberration fueled by American aggressiveness. I'm not saying they're right, by the way. And I, I think they've failed to appreciate how Al-Qaeda has organized itself for this fight. And I think they failed to appreciate how intimidating Al-Qaeda is as a movement and how capable it is of gaining adherence quickly. And so the quietness of Muslim rulers in many re re respects is out of fear. Out of fear that if they talk too much about it, you know, that sometimes the curse that you utter is worse than uh, being silent about it. And so that's kind of what they feel. I, I, I can tell you that there are many Muslim nations that have provided us with intelligence, information, and even troops to deal with this problem in very uh, effective ways, and they all ask that this be kept quiet. And they do that because they're afraid that within, because they're not accountable, per se, to their own people, they don't know what the reaction will be if they're fighting against um, what might become a popular movement. I, I don't excuse it. I think we should demand from our Muslim friends and allies in the region uh, that they denounce this ideology, that they work with us against this ideology, and they not do it behind the scenes but openly. And to get back to this young man's question here, which was such an excellent one to start off the, the questioning, uh, the Saudis are doing things that I think would have been unthinkable years ago in dealing with this particular problem. Um, as far as the draft, I'm a professional soldier by trade. Now I'm a civilian. But my view is, I believe, while we have put an awful lot of burden on a very small force, that the force needs to stay professional. And it needs to stay professional because um, of the tactical and technical expertise that a long-term military force gives you. I, I can't tell you, I, I, you know, we mentioned about going to Grenada. When we went to Grenada, it was right after the end of the Vietnam War, and some of you in the audience may know about it, but it was not a very elegant operation. Uh, but when I see these guys operate today, they operate elegantly. I mean, there'll be somebody in the middle of Afghanistan on a laptop, a sergeant on a laptop, that's talking to a bomber that came from some distant air base somewhere that's precisely giving them a 10-digit grid to be able to hit a target within one meter of the aim point. And this kind of orchestration of military power is unprecedented. Now, it keeps down civilian casualties, and it also keeps down numbers of our own troops. In World War II, to operate in this area the way that I operated as a military commander, I would have needed at least 2.5 million troops. We operated here with 250,000 troops. Now, what, what I don't like about that is it gives everybody else a pass. Now, my impression of this young man's generation is they're serious, they're committed, they're willing to serve, and that we need to provide them with the opportunity to serve and some form of national service that would give options about where you could serve would be uh, a very important move that we could make. Drafting people into the Army, a drafty Army would not be in the field today. We wouldn't be doing this today. I don't know where we'd be. But a drafty Army couldn't make it through uh, Vietnam because of the internal difficulties it created. National service that allows young people to serve abroad State Department, CIA, uh, USAID, that um, gives them the option to choose whether they might choose a military career, um, that allows them to go be in a college, um, a college in, in infirmary or, or hospital or 
you know, some service to the community, I think, is important. And I, I believe that we ought to be smart enough to figure out how to allow them to uh, participate. But again, I want to get back to the point I made previously. If we keep thinking that the Army is going to solve the problem, we're wrong. What we need is to have robust institutions that are political, military, uh, diplomatic, uh, economic, um, national, uh, private enterprise, etc., that allow us to move in a uh, more coordinated and synchronized fashion against the challenges of the 21st century. So it's a long answer to very difficult questions. But yeah, national service that's voluntary, I, I am for. Um, drafting a new army, I'm not for. I think it would move us in a bad direction. We have time for one last quick question. Make this the mother of all, all questions. The way in, all the way in the back, a gentleman in the back with, I think it's green, but I'm called a blind shirt. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's a, I guess it's an Arabic saying that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Is there a way to It's take, also a Nevada saying. <laughs> <laughs> is there a way to take your first two strategic points, the Sunni and Shia extremism, and get them either uh, basically at each other's throats so that they take care of themselves and so we don't have to take care of them as much? Uh, they are at each other's throats. And by the way, this is not good for us. I mean, a big war between Sunnis and Shias in the middle of the Middle East is no better for us than us being there forever. So um, on, on occasion, Sunni extremist groups and Shia extremist groups have found, found common cause against us. But it's rare, and for the most part, we have been keeping them apart. And so I, uh, you know, I, I, I believe that there are more good people in the world than bad people. I believe there are more good Muslims than bad Muslims. I believe that there's a way ahead because I believe in the basic goodness of human beings. And I think that um, the information revolution leads people to want a better life. And we should leverage that in a way that meets people's expectations. It will require a lot of work, but ultimately I believe that the things that the geniuses that shrined our con Constitution and our Declaration of of independence understood that people want to be free, that they want to have the right to express themselves, the right to assemble, the right to many different things. I don't believe that these are just American values. I believe they're universal values. But if America doesn't fight for them, nobody will. General, Thanks. I think that's an excellent place to stop. Uh, I want to say personally, it's been an honor to share the stage with you. I'm going to ask the audience to join me again in thanking you for an excellent set of remarks. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Shall we? We're done. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks.